Thank you. It's a pleasure uh, for me to introduce today's uh, seminar speaker, Dr. Ronick Lockie from UT Southwestern. She is a uh, assistant professor and a physician scientist in the division of nephrology there. Uh, she is going to be telling us today about the role of intracellular cholesterol biosynthesis in ADPKD. Dr. Lucky, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Share my screen here. Okay. Is the screen sharing okay? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So. All right. So today um, I wanted to take the opportunity to share some work that we have been um, doing over the last um, several years, trying to understand the role of intracellular cholesterol biosynthesis in ADPKD. All right. So we all know that in the last decade or, or about the last decade, the PKD research community has made significant processes in appreciating the metabolic aberrancies that underlie the uh, cis progression in polycystic kidney disease, or at least make up part of what why, why cis uh, growth seems to be so rapid. And so um, this cartoon depicts a subset of these findings and uh, does not necessarily include all of them. But as a sort of a overview, you know, Alexander Boletta's group um, uh, described impaired glycolysis. Uh, several groups have shown the aberrancies in the TCA cycle. We and others have found that there is impaired fatty acid oxidation and mitochondrial metabolism. Um, in the cyst epithelial cells of polycystic kidney disease. And together, combining all of these findings, so as you can see here depicted in this cartoon, several different modalities have been employed to try to therapeutically target these aberrancies as a way to slow cyst growth. However, we all recognize that this picture is still incomplete and many facets of cellular metabolism in PKD we do not completely understand. And so to take an additional step towards understanding the abnormal metabolism or the metabolism in cyst epithelial cells, we asked, what about cholesterol biosynthesis? So why, why study cholesterol biosynthesis? So cholesterol is a ligand for receptors and transcription factors um, in normal cellular homeostasis. It's also a critical component of cellular membranes and thus would be required for dividing cells to create new plasma membranes. And finally, it requires significant energy production uh, for, to produce cholesterol given the multitude of steps required. What about in, uh, how is cholesterol important in other aspects of cellular homeostasis? So what has been shown in cancer cells, specifically colorectal cancer, breast cancer, renal cell carcinoma, to name a few, is that the aberrant cholesterol biosynthesis actually increased cholesterol biosynthesis specifically is pathogenic in these hyperproliferative disorders. And since, and given these findings, there have been multiple um, attempts at trying to reduce cholesterol biosynthesis directly by developing therapeutic agents as a way to slow down these uh, specific types of malignancies. And since PKD cells exhibit many of the hallmarks of cancer, including hyperproliferation, we reason that understanding how cholesterol biosynthesis affects cystogenesis may provide additional insights into the pathogenesis of this disorder. So as an initial step, we have to understand how cholesterol is made. And so this cartoon depicts a very simplified graphical representation of the biosynthetic pathway of cholesterol. So it starts with acetyl-CoA and these arrows where there are multiple arrows indicate multiple enzymatic steps, um, at least several um, in this pathway. But what I would like to highlight most simplistically is that there are several um, enzymes in this pathway where mutations in genes have been reported to cause kidney anomalies. So first of all, the mutations in the, the final step required to make cholesterol DHCR7 
um, have been reported to have individuals develop smith lamelli optis syndrome, and individuals with this disorder can develop polycystic kidney disease and has been described in the literature. In addition, several additional genes such as DHCR24 and SCD5D mutations, um, also recessive mutations also re result in kidney anomalies, including renal hypoplasia, py pilectasis, um, and horseshoe kidneys. And so this suggests that perhaps the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway has an implication in kidney development or disease itself. And so first, we wanted to look at what do we know about the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway in our existing data sets in, the, in, in regards to gene expression. So on the left, what you see in panel A here is RNA-seq expression analysis of bulk kidneys that are 18 days old, uh, mouse kidneys, compared to their control. And all of these genes listed here are involved specifically in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. And what you can appreciate from a global perspective is that the expression of these genes is reduced in this mouse model at this age. Similarly, if we look at Ben Humphrey single cell human ADPKD data sets and look at the RNA-seq and ATAC-seq signals, we find that in specifically the principal cell, the expression of these genes involved in cholesterol biosynthesis is reduced. So next we asked, is cholesterol reduced in polycystic kidney disease? And this is not a straightforward answer. And so thus we chose to measure cholesterol using multiple modalities and looking at the literature. So first, by using a sterilomics approach here at UT Southwestern with Jeff McDonald, we measured sterile co composition in 10-day-old kidneys that bear a compound heterozygous mutation in the PKD1 gene uh, compared to control. So these kidneys are mildly cystic, and we look at the percent of ster total sterile contrast, the amount of cholesterol is significantly reduced. Similarly, when we look in the literature, and we look at um, Alexander Boleta's group's uh, measurement of lipidomics, we find that cholesterol in her samples of, of kidney and PKD1 flux null kidneys is also reduced. In a third data set that I'm not showing here, uh, Eduardo Chini's group has also found using an LCMS-based measurement that cholesterol is reduced in PKD1 RCRC kidneys. So moving forward, we adopted, uh, we measured the, expre uh, the abundance of cholesterol using a luminescence-based technique to measure total and free cholesterol. And so first we measured cholesterol in mouse ADPKD kidneys, and we find that compared to wild-type kidneys, 18-day-old kidneys uh, with the compound heterozygous PKD1 flux RC mutation have reduction in total cholesterol and free cholesterol. Similarly, when we measure total cholesterol in human ADPKD kidney samples, that which we have um, been fortunate to obtain from the Kansas University PKD Center, we find that there is, again, indeed a reduction in total and free cholesterol. And this is all normalized to the total protein content to obtain adequate measurements uh, that are consistent. Now, to see if this is something that we see in in vitro systems as well as a method for future interrogations and further studies to build on, we measured total cholesterol in in ADPKD cell lines. So the first two graphs that I'm showing here show total and free cholesterol of an immortalized ADPKD kidney collecting ducts kidney epithelial cell line that has been generated in our laboratory, where the control is a PKD one plus plus cell line, and it's offspring is the PKD1 null cell line. And we find that indeed total cholesterol is reduced in this cell line. Second, in a separate cell line, which I will describe in slightly more detail in a few slides, we measured total cholesterol in the PKD1 RC plus cell line, which we have ma made in a similar fashion. And its offspring is the PKD1 RC minus cell line. And again, we find that total and free cholesterol um, are reduced. So together we see we, that there is clearly a perturbation in, in cholesterol abundance in kidney ep epithelial cells in, in vitro and in, kid in cystic kidneys. And so we ask, how can we manipulate how much cholesterol is made or the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway? 
And so to do this, we have to understand how cholesterol uh, biosynthesis is regulated and to and to, uh, most importantly, we have to understand the pathway by which this is occurred. So cholesterol is regulated, synthesis is regulated by several transcription factors called sterile regulatory element binding proteins, SREBP. Now, the activity of SREBP is tightly regulated by two proteins, INSIG and SCAP. And so in order for SREBP, which is housed in the ER, to make its way to the nucleus to act, SCAP serves as a chaperone protein to move SRABP from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi. Only then can SRABP be cleaved such that it can go to the nucleus to target the transcription of genes involved in cholesterol or lipid biosynthesis. Now there's one caveat, is that SCAP can only escort SRABP from the ER to the Golgi when it is dissociated from INSIG. So in order for this process to occur, INSIG must dissociate from SCAP, and then SCAP can escort SRABP to the Golgi apparatus for further processing and activity. And so we can leverage this pathway, which was made famous here at UT Southwestern by the Brown and Goldstein Laboratory, to manipulate cholesterol biosynthesis. And that is exactly what we did. So first, we decided that we will inhibit cholesterol biosynthesis. And so the way we that we approach this is we inhibited SCAP expression by genetically deleting SCAP in our mouse models of kidneys uh, in mouse models. Uh, and this allows, uh, inhibits SRABP from moving from the ER to the Golgi. And hence we have turned off the transcription of target genes involved in cholesterol biosynthesis. This has not previously been studied in the kidney, and what we found is that when we genetically delete SCAP using ksp Cree, uh, this is really quite deleterious to tubule homeostasis. These mice die at P1 um, due to um, your general abnormalities. But what we also see is that there's clearly dilatation of the kidney tubules, even when we delete only one allele of SCAP. And so this was our first clue that perhaps Manipulating this pathway in the kidney um, has a physiological uh, function and in the context of PKD may uh, prove to provide us additional insights into the pathogenesis of this disorder. And so next, in order to study the role of SCAP in polycystic kidney disease, we bypassed that developmental time point and used an inducible PKD1 mutant mouse model of polycystic kidney disease where we induced recombination of both PKD1 and SCAP using doxycycline at 28 days of age for 10 days, and then sacrificed our mice at 75 days of age. And so what we find is that first, most important, uh, is that deletion of SCAP on its own in, the, in an adult kidney uh, leads to histologically indistinguishable kidneys from the wild type which allows us to study the function of this gene in the context of PKD. However, in the context of polycystic kidney disease, as you can see here, there's clearly a traumatic aggravation of cis burden. And this is evidenced by a significant increase in our kidney weight, body weight ratio, our cyst index, and our serum creatinine. Now, next, to see if this finding is unique to this mouse model or if we can recapitulate it in other mouse models of polycystic kidney disease, we deleted SCAP using pkhd one Cree as an aggressive mouse model of polycystic kidney disease. And we find that indeed at 21 days of age, we see a significant increase in our kidney weight to body weight ratio and our cyst index and serum creatinine. So both in an adult onset um, and in an aggressive uh, onset model of PKD1 mutant mouse models, we see an aggress uh, uh, a worsening of kidney disease, cis burden. So as an additional third model, we, we asked whether we would see the same aggravation of cis growth in a hypomorphic PKD1 mutant mouse model. Now here we deleted just simply one allele of SCAP using ksp Cree, and that was sufficient to reduce SCAP expression in the kidney. And we followed PKD1 RCRC mice with MRIs 
for 100 until at 180 days of age and measured total kidney volume normalized to body weight. And we found that deletion of simply one allele of SCAP is sufficient to aggravate the cyst burden measured by total kidney volume and raise serum B wet. So together, these studies suggest in a slightly counterintuitive fashion that reduction of SCAP, which reduces cholesterol biosynthesis, uh, actually promotes cyst growth. And this is the opposite of the predominant uh, cancer literature that suggests that inhibition of cholesterol biosynthesis can actually lead to slowing of malignant cells. And so next we asked if we increase cholesterol biosynthesis, what will be the phenotypic outcome? And so in order to increase cholesterol biosynthesis, we have to inhibit NSAIG. And when we inhibit or knock out NSAIG, we can allow for SCAP to go from the ER to the Golgi and allow for unrestrained transcription of the target genes involved in cholesterol biosynthesis. And so first we asked, uh, what is the role of NSAIG 1 and 2 in the kidney? And we find that unlike SCAP, deletion of NSAIG 1 and 2, there are two different um, genes that encode NSAIGs and they function predominantly the same way. And so we have to delete both genes. We find that there is no phenotypic uh, or physiological or phenotypic um, changes compared to a control kidney. So these mice live a completely normal lifespan. They breed in Mendelian ratios and they really are histologically indistinguishable from the control kidneys. And so this allows us to study the role of NSAIG 1 and 2 in our mouse models of polycystic kidney disease. And so first we deleted NSAIG 1 and 2 in the mouse model that we like to use um, quite frequently, the compound heterozygous model where we have one allele that is flux to PKD1 and the other allele is an RC allele. And these are kidney h &E sections at 18 days of age. So you can see compared to a kidney that expresses NSAIG 1 and 2, um, here is with the orange dot, a kidney in which we have deleted NSAIG 1 and 2 has substantially reduced cis burden. And, uh, as, and this is evidenced by a reduction in our kidney weight to body weight ratio, a profound reduction in our cyst index and in our serum creatinine. When we do molecular analysis, we find that we indeed see a reduction in KIM1 and NGALA expression. And finally, we performed a survival analysis, and we find that deletion of NSAIG 1 and 2 in this mouse model substantially prolongs life uh, of the mouse almost to a normal lifespan. So next, we asked, what about an adult onset model of ADPKD? Is this something that is unique to the developing mouse kidney and this aggressive model, or is, the, or is this something that we can see in a second mouse model? And so we used the inducible PKD1 mutant mouse model where we induced recombination at 28 days of age of PKD1 and in SIG1 and 2. And what we find is that indeed, reduction of NSIG 1 and 2 or deletion is sufficient to rescue uh, cyst growth in this adult onset model. And so these are histological sections of kidneys at 112 days of age. And what you see is that there's clearly a rescue in our um, kidney weight to body weight ratio, our cyst index, and in our serum creatinine. And so together, these studies suggest that Increasing cholesterol biosynthesis can slow cyst growth in the kidney, and reducing cholesterol biosynthesis aggravates cyst growth in the kidney um, based on our genetic manipulations of the regulators of SRABP signaling. However, as a way to confirm that we are indeed transcriptionally activating or inhibiting these genes that we propose by our genetic deletions, we perform bulk RNA-seq in both our gain and loss of function models. And we identified over 1600 differentially expressed genes in both uh, of, our, of our models. 783 of these were reciprocally expressed genes, meaning genes that were up in one model, but down in the other or vice versa. And when we perform pathway analysis, we find that indeed we have activated cholesterol biosynthesis pathway genes dramatically in our NSIG knockout models. However, we have inhibited cholesterol biosynthesis in our SCAP knockout. And so it confirms from a molecular standpoint that our genetic, genetic mouse models are behaving as they are expected to behave in the kidney. 
So next we asked if we see that clearly cholesterol biosynthesis can promote or slow, uh, can slow cyst growth and reduction of this pathway promote cyst growth. Is this something that is unique or specific to our kidney mouse models? Or can we actually look at this in an in vitro setting? And do we see something that is cell intrinsic in this regard? And so to do this, we needed to study a mouse, a cellular model that mimics many of the hallmarks of polycystic kidney disease. And so this is one set of cell lines that we have developed in our laboratory. We, a PKD1 RC plus parent with its offspring as a PC, PKD1 RC minus cell line where we have uh, induced recombination of that plus gene to have a null allele. So you can see we have reduction in PC1 expression, um, but these cells grow faster and they exhibit some of the hallmarks of polycystic kidney disease. So the rate of growth by Alomar blue assays increase. They also make larger cysts compared to their parent cell line and have increased expression of CMIC among several other uh, phenotypic findings as well. So you, we use this RC minus cell line and asked whether the phenotypic findings that we see in our in vivo models can be recapitulated in vitro for further downstream dissection and understanding of these pathways for future studies. And so we use CRISPR-Cas9 to delete SCAP or INSIG in our PKD1RC minus cell line. So the control is the PKD1RC minus cell line. And what we find is that we were only able to delete one allele of SCAP in the cell line. Um, however, that is sufficient to aggravate cyst growth. Similarly, or conversely, when we delete INSIG2, we find that we the just we confirm that the expression of INSIG2 is reduced. And INSIG2 RC minus cell lines in which we have reduced INSIG2 or deleted INSIG2 have a dramatically smaller uh, 3, 3D kidney cyst size as well. So manipulation of these pathway genes in an in vitro system seems to phenocopy our in vivo observations as well, suggesting again the intracellular nature of this, of this process. And as an additional step, we have used um, several uh, human ADPKD cell lines um, that we have immortalized. Uh, and so these are two different donors here, and we've treated these cell lines with siRNA such that we significantly reduce the expression of INSIG1 and 2, and so thus we are trying to augment cholesterol biosynthesis. And we find that in each of these cell lines, when we measure the size of these cysts that can be made in a 3D matrix gel system, there is a sufficient, uh, significant reduction in the size of the cysts as measured um, and quantified here in this graph here. And then finally, as an additional um, out readout of pathogenic markers of polycystic kidney disease, we find that there is indeed a reduction specifically in PCREB expression in when we use INSIG1 or 2 siRNA in these human ADPKD donor cell, cell lines. And so next we asked, well, how does enhancing cholesterol biosynthesis pathways slow cyst growth? And so, you know, I, I need to take a step back here and and sort of mentioned that there are two SREBPs, and, and to keep things simple, um, there are only there are two, and SREBP one uh, regulates both cholesterol and fatty acid lipid biosynthesis, whereas SREBP two regulates the cholesterol biosynthesis genes primarily. And so each of these genes are both regulated in the same fashion. And so is there a way to tease out the findings that we see that are, are they specific to cholesterol or, or is it um, the fatty acid lipid side? And so as an initial step, we have perform studies where we're looking at only um, deleting SRABP2. And if we delete SRABP2, we will reduce a major component of cholesterol biosynthesis signaling. And perhaps will that phenocopy the SCAP knockout where we find re by reducing SRABP signaling globally, we aggravated cyst growth. So indeed, we do find that when we reduce SRABP2, genetically delete SRABP2 in our PKD1 inducible mutant mouse model, there's an aggravation of cyst growth, but it is 
not completely to the same degree um, as the scap knockout. And we would say that it partially phenocopies the scap knockout that we um, have previously seen. And I suspect that this is likely secondary to the fact that we still, SRABP1 is still present and SRABP1 can promote the transcription of cholesterol biosynthesis genes. What it does tell us that it is that the co com contribution of the SRAB of lipid biosynthesis is is um, is not completely responsible for the aggravation that we see, and perhaps that has some component. But clearly, the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway is in part responsible for modulation of cis burden in our models of polycystic kidney disease. And so together, I think in culmination of these studies, we, we found that total cholesterol appears to be reduced in the cystic kidney. And when we inhibit the SRABP pathway, this aggravates the growth of the cyst. Conversely, when we promote the SRABP pathway, we see a significant suppression of cyst growth. And we see these findings both in vitro and in, and in vivo settings. And I think our study suggests that really the dissection of, of the downstream target genes of the SRABP2 pathway are really necessary to determine what are the direct regulators of cyst progression and enhance our understanding of this disease given, um, given the notations or the known findings that mutations in some of these downstream genes involved in, col in cholesterol biosynthesis can lead to kidney anomalies. Um, and should lead to further understanding and pinpointing the exact role of uh, which genes or enzymes are responsible for showing us this dramatic uh, phenotypic effect in our mouse models of disease. And so with that, um, I'd really like to acknowledge um, our PKD research group here at UT Southwestern, my mentor, Dr. Patel, um, and uh, our collaborators here on campus with the, that help us with our lipidomic studies um, and all of you for, for listening today. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand and we'll call on you so we can have an active discussion. Uh, Stephen's already got his hand up there. Go ahead, Steve. Hey, very interesting work. Um, I'm curious if you've given any consideration to the other arm of the SREVP pathway, which would be its effects on transcription of the LDL receptor. Yeah, everything you've done focuses on the, the pathway for the biosynthesis, the cholesterol, but have you looked at whether modifying expression of the LDL receptor affects progression in any way? No, we have not looked at that yet. That is something that we should do. Robbie. Hi, Ronald. That was a really great talk. I really enjoyed it. And you have some beautiful data. Um, I was curious, you know that I'm interested in cilia and many ciliary proteins are, are regulated by the ciliary membrane composition. And I was curious if you looked at perhaps TULP3 or others that, that do have differential expression or yeah, expression based on ciliary membrane composition. No, we haven't looked at TULP3, but, but we can. Um, yeah, we, we're still trying to look at the cilia in this context. Alan? Nice. Nice work, Ronak, beautiful presentation. So uh, as you know, statins have been tested in PKD and seem to, at least in one study, to actually improve the disease. What, what would you, your prediction be based on your work and is, would it be the opposite? No, so I think that um, when I first started seeing this data initially, that was really quite the conundrum based on the young adult studies that have been done and then, uh, you know, and then moving forward. But let me tell you a few facts of why I think actually all of it likely will fit together. So first, so recognizing the clinical trials that have been done. So the first trial that was done with statins in young adults um, showed a benefit um, in the total kidney volume progression. Um, but then a subsequent study, um, it was a reanalysis, I believe, of the HALT-PKD study that actually looked at uh, individuals on statins and whether or not their rate of rise of total kidney volume changed um, over time, showed that they didn't really actually see a benefit in older individuals. And at that time, the thought process was perhaps what they were, what you were seeing was something that was limited to younger adults and the benefit that might be the case. That all being said, I believe there's a statin study that just completed at the University of Colorado. So maybe we will get some, some data. But from a mechanistic standpoint, 
Statins have very pleiotropic effects. And what we are studying here is very an intracellular based mechanism that's independent of the statin. I actually have tried to look, I don't know how much statins make their way to the kidney themselves, um, first of all. Second of all, there is more and more literature coming out um, about statin resistance. And so when you give a statin, the idea is that you're actually inhibiting HMGCR. That's the function that you would think. But in the process, when this happens, it actually inhibits the degradation of HMGCR itself. And so that's why individuals need higher and higher doses of statins to reach the same goals. And so thus you have a res uh, what, is, what is deemed HMGCR resistance because you're actually increasing HMGCR in this process. So you could technically be giving a statin and increasing HMGCR, and then you're making more cholesterol, and that would fit what we are seeing here. So that's one way to think about it. Um, secondly, there are several papers, and one that came out, I believe, in January this year, looking at giving statins in diabetic mouse models, polycystic uh, diabetic mouse models, and they actually found that it actually made the disease worse. Um, and so I don't know for the kidney, I think the jury is, is still out. So I hope that sort of answers your question. Yeah. Jim. Yeah. You're muted, Jim. What about a high fat diet? So a high fat diet, um, we have not specifically given a high fat diet to mice, but I have given a high cholesterol. So equal caloric, equal fat, but high cholesterol diet to mouse, mice with kidneys, polycystic kidneys, and there's no, um, there's no benefit. So you, this, does that mean that the, the LDL receptors are not really doing anything? Or I the, think that it tells the LDL you that receptors is, are low? That this is really a cell, uh, it's a cell specific phenotype that we're seeing. Um, and even when we ingest high cholesterol, it has to, if, if we have to give it um, to the kidney, I don't know if it necessarily makes it there. But you haven't tried the fatty acids as well? No, we have not. Yashihara. Thank you for a beautiful talk. I'm wondering uh, what is the contribution of the liver and the kidney, uh, kidney uh, in terms of the uh, cholesterol in the uh, kidney. So uh, what, what do you think? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know specifically what is the contribution of um, how much cholesterol that's made in the liver makes its, its way specifically to the kidney um, itself. I think that our studies show you that likely, um, given that we have not perturbed the liver, that we like, you know, that there is not a large contribution to that trying to, you know, perform a, a rescue, per se. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like if there's a kind of clinical correlation between cholesterol level and the uh, uh, total kidney volume uh, kind of uh, time span would be very interesting. But uh, thank you so much. Thanks. There's a question in the chat. Um, in the cholesterol dietary changes, were those on the conditional mutant mouse model um, that would not alter your pathway changes in the kidney? Oh, that's a great question. So we did it We did it two ways. Um, we gave cholesterol to an inducible PKD1 mutant mouse model where um, they were given a high cholesterol diet at, um, they were induced at 28 days, we waited till 45 days till they developed some cystic disease. And then we gave them a high cholesterol diet and sacrificed the mice at hundred days. And we found that there was no, no benefit there. We also used our compound heterozygous PKD1 mutant mouse model. And we gave cholesterol to the mice at a, at a younger age and sacrificed them early. And again, we see that there's no benefit. But, but that's still just deletion in the kidney, correct? Correct. That's only deletion in the kidney. So the dietary changes are systemic, but any of the genetic changes are restricted to kidney tubules because it's the PAX-8. C correct. It's, yeah, it's the, it's the, it's, it's a kidney specific Cree. Yeah. Okay. Paul. Wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, using a reagent that we developed in the RRC use, uh, that allows the conditional inactivation of polycystin 2 in vitro, and then doing RNA-seq almost immediately after the knockout. Um, one of the, the biggest changes is in sterol metabolism and lipid metabolism. Many of the enzymes that you discussed uh, 
were identified and others. It's worth looking at the, the gene list. I'm happy to send it to you right away. But my question is this, do you envision a feedback loop uh, which immediately after the inactivation of the polycystins drives or alters uh, cholesterol metabolism? That's a great question. So we, I would love to see that that data set um, and see see what it what it shows. You know, looking through, we have quite a few bulk RNA seq sets, um, but most of them are uh, of cystic, uh, you know, models where we have significant disease already. And although uh, we see a reduction in cholesterol, like I showed you, you know, it is not the predominant downregulated pathway that I see in these. I actually, I, you know, these genes are all significantly reduced, but when you perform sort of a global pathway analysis, it's, it's much lower on the list compared to other, uh, other, G, other pathways that are hyperactivated or downregulated. And so I'm surprised to see that in an in vitro setting. Um, I'd, I'd really like to see this to see what comes of it. I'm going to ask one, force one in here real quickly, if I can. Um, I know most of the models you looked at were kidney-specific deletions, but did any of them have, that were not kidney-specific, uh, have a liver phenotype? And did this cholesterol alterations have an impact on the, on the liver phenotypes? So we did, uh, we deleted one allele of SCAP using KSP Cree in the PKD1 RCRC mouse, but um, those mice did not have, cyst obviously, cystic liver disease. So you didn't have it. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Not hearing any. Dr. Locke, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, I guess the, the at the end of these, we always ask whether there is something that the PKDRRC could do to help further your research. If there's any resource that you would like us to consider generating, um, love to hear it. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, we've benefited quite a bit from a lot of, uh, quite a few of the resources from the RC specifically antibodies and, and some cell lines. Um, I'm really actually excited to hear about these immediate RNA-seq studies that you're performing with these cell lines. So I'd love to be able to see some of this data. Yeah, okay. great. We'll get it to you. All right, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, greatly appreciate the active discussion, guys. Um, we'll see you in a month, so thank you.